Hello and welcome. This is a recorded webinar of the Q&A COVID-19 vaccine information session, which took place on Tuesday, the 27th of April, 2021. Self-Help UK were joined by the Nottingham and Nottinghamshire Clinical Commissioning Group to answer questions from self-help and peer support groups within Nottingham. Um, as we all know, it's been an extremely different year and as people that work in the communities that are looking at setting up groups, we were out and about delivering events, speaking to the community, getting people engaged um, and all of that sort of stopped. And this year, really, what we've been doing is trying to get groups online, trying to get events up and running that we've been that we, like the one that we've got today and um, looking at digital exclusion um, trying to support IT, trying to get training out there and also looking at developing new groups. So we the COVID survivors project um, it was very obviously relevant for the time and we felt we had to do something as part of this crisis. So we've developed a, um, a Facebook group and a support network for COVID survivors and helped lots of new groups as well develop. So we've been working differently this year and I think it really will change the way we operate moving forward because I think this is going to be part of what we do in terms of Zoom groups as well as the face to face. So yep, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Great, thanks Martha. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do then is um, go ahead and invite Alex Ball um, to introduce himself, followed by um, Van Alazawi. So Alex Ball is the Director of Communications and Engagement at the Nottingham CCG and Van Alazawi is a GP. Um, so I'll hand it over to Alex, please. You've taken away everything I was going to say. Uh, really? Is there no yeah. more? <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, um, as Chelsea says, I'm uh, Alex Ball. I'm Director of Communications and Engagement at the CCG. People might not, might not know what CCG is, so we're a clinical commissioning group. What that means is we're part of the NHS and our job mm -hmm. is to um, work out what services people want from healthcare, um, work out how we're going to deliver those and ultimately kind of administer the money uh, that goes to pay for that health care that, um, that we all need. Um, so obviously the pandemic has been a, has been a, big, a big focus for the last 14, 15 months, mm. and the vaccination programme in particular for the last four or five. So really happy to be here tonight to um, answer people's questions, hopefully clear up any kind of concerns that people have about the vaccination programme and help explain how they can uh, go ahead and, and get the vaccine um, if that's what to do uh, and yeah really happy to be here with <clears throat> my clinical colleague who will be answering all the difficult questions and, and answering words that I can't pronounce about various clinical things so over to you maybe Van. Yes hi I'm Van Alazawi I'm a GP in Nottingham I'm a salary GP I would GP practice and as well as uh, I do out of our NEMS after hours um, during the weekend if needed. Um, as, as we all said, this has been a challenging and difficult year for all of us. We've seen, as Martha said, everything is, is changed this year, even as a GPs, we're not seeing patient face to face unless it's needed. It's mainly through either telephone consultation or also video calls. And it has the change on, uh, on the way how we deal and manage patients now. And um, we're trying to support people as much as we can. Um, it's been challenging for everybody, not just um, uh, the NHS staff, but people as well, because there, I can see from my experience, people are trying to not call us all the time, try to really call us when it's urgent, not to put pressure on us. And we thank you all for doing this, but please, if there's anything you're worried about, we're, we are here to help you. So please call us if you need, that's why we are here. So I think to start the session is, as we said, is we're talking about the vaccination because um, at the moment, I think UK is one of the good um, um, uh, countries in the world who are doing very well with the vaccination. And I think until now we've vaccinated uh, nearly 46 million, 33 million is uh, first dose and 12 million have had their second dose completed the full course. So that's great. So, and our aim, all of us is to push people to get the vaccine to protect themselves from um, the COVID um, uh, disease and we can see what's happening in India. It's heartbreaking. And it's if people say this is it's it's not serious, then just look what's happening in India and you know how serious it is. That's why we're pushing for the vaccine and we're here to answer questions and to make you at ease. And hopefully you can decide to go and have the vaccine. It's your choice at the end of the day. But we we as 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 NHS, as every health worker is is 
is to push people to get the vaccine to protect themselves. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with introducing the, of course, people will want to know vaccine. There, there has been so many. The most important thing is, please, if you want to understand about a vaccine, don't go on Facebook, don't go on, 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 on WhatsApp or chat, chat group. Some information is not correct. There, we will give you information to Shazia to share with you if you want to discuss things or read more. We will give you the correct information. Some informations are not correct. I see that on Facebook, on WhatsApp, and sometimes it's just, I can't do anything about it. I can't stop it. But so we try to give you as much as information um, and website where you can visit to understand. Um, there has been so many news about the type of vaccine in the that's going on over there's the Chinese vaccine there's Johnson and Johnson there is I think um, other new vaccine that's coming now but at the moment in the UK UK government and NHS has approved only three types of vaccine that are currently being used the first one is called the Pfizer bio biotech um, uh, vaccine the um, um, Oxford AstraZeneca and the Moderna vaccine. Both of them, uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine work similar and slightly different than the AstraZeneca. So the um, to tell you about what the vaccine is, is the, the Pfizer and the Moderna is just a synthetic mRNA, uh, which delivers a tiny piece of the genetic code of the virus. We know, and I think everybody's seen that in TV, that the COVID, how, how the TV shows you the COVID is like a, a circle and there is a spikes there that's called the spike protein. And that's how they are delivering this genetic code of the spike protein. So what they're doing, they're, they're introducing this genetic code of the spike protein to our body. Our body recognizes it. It will duplicate it into a spike protein. When the spike protein is generated, it can penetrate the cells of the body. Now, our body is, is formed very clever and it's got a very good, nice immune system. So is, is, is just imagine your cells as your house and if somebody had come to it and attacked it and your body will respond by producing antibodies. And these antibodies will attack this foreign body, whether the virus or the bacteria. And what happens? They attack it, they kill it. At the same time, our body is so clever, it will memorize this, this spike protein of the COVID. So if so, will develop immunity toward it. So when this virus attacks it again, attack our body again, then it's ready to fight and it's good to fight. That's why with the I'll, I'll speak about the AstraZeneca and then and then and explain this. And that's what for the for the Pfizer and Madonna, for the AstraZeneca, the clever uh, doctors, professors who've done it, and we appreciate them very well. Um, as they used a, a very harmless virus, they took all the all the bad things from it, and they just put that spike protein of the COVID into this virus, inject in our body. So once the spike protein goes in our body, gets out of the virus, spreads in our blood, go into the cell, our body will think this is foreign body, This the, the it will attack it again. The same process forms antibody. Our system will remember it. When it attacks it again, it will protect us from having the disease. And that's why when they advised about the COVID, the vaccine, it's, it helps, it doesn't say once you get the COVID, it doesn't mean that you're not going to COVID, get COVID. No, you are at risk of catching COVID, but because your body is already prepared to attack it, you'll get less severe COVID. And you'll get less severe COVID, that means less people going to hospital. And to be honest with you, we can see that happening at the moment. The number of people, the number of admissions to hospital has reduced much than it was in November and January. So it's important that we have the vaccine because it helps you to make, if you catch the disease, then it will help you to make it mild. And if you're, you've got high risk factors such as diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, and other uh, diseases, then it will make you less being admitted to hospital and being seriously ill. And sometimes people are being on ventilator, which is a very serious life-threatening um, situation. 
Okay, so that's a brief about the virus, the, the vaccine that we are having at the moment. So it's three at the moment in the UK. Nothing is being mentioned about other new vaccine, but we are doing this at the moment. I hope that's clear. Is there any questions? Does that that's really sound clear, helpful. Shazia? That's really helpful because uh, some of the things that you've just talked about now, Ban, were some of the questions that were posed. So you've answered them. I think we, we should now start looking at these questions one by one and then we can start answering them. Um, yes. Thank you for that. So the first question that we've got is, is the AstraZeneca vaccine safe now that we know that it causes blood clots? Okay, AstraZeneca, it's safe. And it's um, any, just to add, any medicine in the UK, any medicine or any vaccine or any health product, um, cannot be introduced in the community and to people unless it's been passed by the MHRA, which is a UK regulator that looks after it, it studies it, it makes sure that it has all the, the, the safe um, points around it before giving it, giving it to people and giving it, it wouldn't take that risk if it's not safe. The MHRA say that the AstraZeneca is safe, it's highly effective, and you should take it. However, in some European countries, possibly as well in the UK, they found a very small number of people who developed blood clots or a bleed after taking the, Astra, the first dose or the first jab of AstraZeneca. They're still not sure why this has happened. They're still unclear. They're looking into it carefully. And but still, and if you counted there's compared to the number of people who've had, there's millions of people who've had the vaccine, but only limited or very rare number people developed this clot or bleeding. And they've advised now that people who are under, under 30, after looking at it and studying it, should not take the AstraZeneca and should be offered other, such as Pfizer or Moderna. And that could be, of course, done. And that's an information given to all the local helplines when you book for, and they, once you, they see you're under 30, they will not offer you. But in general, they say the benefit of, of having the AstraZeneca overweighs the risk of the clots. These clots and or bleed are very rare. They're not sure why they happened. Is it related to the vaccine? Is it related to the human being immune system that's reacting so bad and causing this? So they're still studying this, but, and the advice, if you had your first jab, everything went well, you should take the second jab and it's safe, it's highly effective. That's what I was just gonna ask. I was just gonna ask if people have already had the first jab, it's still okay to have the second jab, yeah. If that's, that's what the advice we're given, and this mm -hmm. is not my advice, we are following um, scientists who are working, believe me, when we say they are working 24 hours a day, they are working 24 hours a day, because this is a pandemic, they're trying to, it, it's spreading so wide, and they're trying to control it as much as they can, and this is, we get updates every few days, and this is the update, if you had your first jab, of the AstraZeneca, even if you're under 30, if 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 nothing happened, then go ahead and take your second vaccine. It's important to take it. Um, and uh, still, and the other thing is these the rare blood clots and the bleed that happened, it normally happens in in the community and anyway, it happens in certain people. We don't know why some people develop these clots without having the COVID jab. And we don't know why. So they're looking into it and they want, they're trying to establish connection with it. But it's a very rare thing to happen. The other thing is that people need not to forget because all the concentration of the news is about, oh, Astra, uh, uh, as that the um, uh, AstraZeneca can cause clots, is that P don't forget people who got, get the COVID disease do develop clots as well without having the jab as well. So it is. A it's a dangerous anyway that if you some people and we don't know why some people when they have COVID they have clots in their lungs in their legs they bleed we don't know and they're still looking into that so it's not they're still I can't give you the correct answer 100% because every day the scientists are coming with new thing before so if you, it's for two weeks three weeks ago now said that don't give it to under 30 but go ahead over 30 if you've had the first jab 
go ahead with the second jab if you didn't develop any complication or side effect that needed you to see a GP or a doctor for it. I hope this is clear. Yeah, that's really helpful. In terms of the messaging around um, under 30s not having AstraZeneca, um, I think it might be just, I think I'm glad that you mentioned again, because I think that's important for people to know. What if people did receive or did experience um, an allergic reaction to their first injection what would their next steps be that's what a, options that's, do they have okay i think that's two different questions an allergic reaction is totally different than developing a clot okay that's two different type of reactions allergic reaction is when you get allergy like you get a, a rush swollen face swollen lips then you have to inform your gp you have to inform about that then he will discuss with specialized people at the hospital and they will assess whether that patient is eligible to go ahead with, with the second dose with any vaccine not necessarily just the AstraZeneca with any vaccine whether the Madonna or Pfizer or the or the AstraZeneca okay although the advice and the course I did they said even if they develop slight allergic reaction they they still sometimes go ahead with it but after there's a team where we discuss discuss it. So this is a totally different question, allergic reaction. You normally, after these viruses, you will develop pain in your um, um, arm, you will develop some redness. That's not allergic reaction, that's expected um, with every vaccination you had, whether the, the, the COVID or whether mums will know when they give immunization to their children, that they go, they will have this pain and redness around the site of injection. Or if you're going for a holiday and you take any vaccine, you'll get symptoms. That's normal reaction. With the AstraZeneca, if we are talking about the side effect of AstraZeneca and if the people are concerned about having a clot and where to communicate yet to contact um, GP or doctors or out of hour, there are a few red flags that people need to know, okay? If you had the COVID vaccine, it, this, this small or rare blood clot could happen between day four and, and, and four weeks af after taking the, the, the vaccine. The symptoms are very clear and it is these red flags should, should raise sus suspicious that please go and ask your GP. Severe headache, that's not responding to paracetamol and is getting worse. Headache that keeps you awake at night, that get worse when lying flat or bending forward or straining. Any blurred vision with this headache, any nausea, any vomiting with it. If the family around you see you that you're confused, like if you've got headache and you become confused, or if there is any sight of seizures, not necessarily the big seizure, but twitching or any abnormal movement, then the advice is you need to seek urgent medical help by calling 999 or even 111, they can transfer you to 999. The other is, that's for the headache. The other red flags that they should look into if they develop any small, purple color spots like a bleed under the skin. If they de develop chest pain, especially when taking deep breath and they can't take a deep breath, so they're breathing shallow like this, very small and shallow breath. And every time they want to take a deep breath, it kind of, their pain catches them from doing this or pain or swelling in the legs or abdominal pain, then you need to seek urgent medical advice. And that's between a window between four day to four weeks within taking the AstraZeneca. That's really helpful. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, okay. Okay, but, in, so but in general, to make it clear, because people now will think, okay, what if we didn't, when do we get? In general, any vaccine, including the COVID, you will, which is normally given in the arm, unless indicated otherwise, that's a different story. Any vaccine that's given in the arm, it's going to be painful, which is acceptable. It's going to be, uh, you will feel unwell in the first 24 hours, like you, you've caught a cold or a flu symptoms. You'll feel achy, sometimes feel nausea, sometimes mild headache, sometimes mild temperature of 38, which goes away within 24 to 48 hours. However, if the temperature persists over 48 hours, if you develop persistent cough, if you develop um, uh, um, loss of smell or taste, 
then you need to test for COVID because sometime you might have COVID before you had the, vac uh, the vaccine and the symptoms appear. So, so if you had the jab, within 48 hours, things will get better. But if it persists with the temperature, feeling unwell, um, headache, cough, just call 111. And they've got a great advice on this, on what to do next. Great. Thank you for that. That's okay. Um, so let's move. I don't know if Alex, if there was anything else that you wanted to share on that, you're happy to move on, or is there anything you would like to say? No, I think <clears throat> Ban's covered that incredibly well. I, I just stress again, every medicine has some side effects and some risks. But overwhelmingly, the risk of catching COVID is a much, much, much higher risk for you than having any vaccine. So it's not just having COVID in the first instance, um, but then the long COVID symptoms, which I'm sure people have read about, <clears throat> can be really, really considerable. There are people who had this illness this time last year and are still suffering. Mm. So overwhelmingly, all of the evidence suggests that it is much, much better to have the vaccine than, um, uh, than not. Um, there is some risk. There's always a risk with any medication or any kind of health intervention but um, it is so much worse to catch COVID than to have any of the side effects of the, of the vaccine. So if you're at all worried, the best advice I've heard, <clears throat> excuse me, the best advice I've heard, if you're at all worried, make your appointment for your vaccination if you're eligible, and you'll be able to talk to the nurses and the doctors on site. Um, they'll have, they'll, they're doing this every single day. So make your appointment, if you've got questions, you've then got dedicated time with a healthcare professional who can help you understand all your options. And then if you decide to have it, you're there and it can be done in, in the next minute. Um, so um, yeah, if, if, I'm really happy to hear more questions from people obviously as the rest of the evening goes on. But that's, that's certainly the best advice I've heard of if you've got questions and want to talk to someone about it, then they're waiting for you at the vaccination centres. Can I just add, just, so, sorry, Shazia, just just an important thing. The COVID vaccine, it's a non-live vaccine. It does not give you COVID, okay? Okay, that's, that's great, because we, if you hold that thought, we've got that question later on. So let me go through those questions and I'll get those answered. Uh, Martha, was you about to say something? Or? Yeah, I was just going to add to what you were saying, Alex, and I know that some people have sort of thought, well, if I do get COVID, I'm probably, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm healthy, I'm not, you know, nothing bad's going to happen to me, so I don't need the vaccine. But running the long COVID support group and the COVID survivors, I think long COVID is a really important thing to put out there because people of all ages, of all backgrounds, of all health, you know, have suffered with long COVID and it has completely destroyed their lives, you know, and absolutely, you know, their employment, their benefits, you know, being able to, to do normal activities for any age group. I mean, my sister has had long COVID for six months. She's 27 years old, completely healthy, you know, know completely healthy person and I don't think that's a message that's getting out there enough yeah you, you may survive COVID but that doesn't mean that you're still not at risk of developing long COVID and I think that's another important reason that people should get the vaccine yeah yeah, yeah. thanks for that Martha well, Jazzy I think you're on mute still I am aren't I here I am um, yeah, I was just about to say we're halfway through um, with a couple of questions answered and there's quite a, a few. So what I'd probably say is um, maybe for the sake of time, what we can do is shorten the answers, but it, the elaborations can take place in the chat. And also, I know that Sasha is going to link the FAQ, the, um, the questions um, website that is on the CCG website, right, um, Alex? So you've got a section that's um dedicated to answering questions around the vaccine so we can have that as well so um so we know that my second question was going to be are they going to stop the astrazeneca va vaccine no we've established yeah. that um how long does the vaccine last and what that means is in the body does it require a top up um it said it it is we're giving the, as the two jabs, and they found that giving two jabs of, of the COVID vaccine makes your immunity better. And they say at the moment, the studies is showing that it could last for a year and longer, but this is, this is still 
and, and, and they're, they're still monitoring. It's a new vaccine. There's studies going on every day on, on the people taking these vaccines. There's a group of people who ha are under the microscope being um, monitored. So until now, it's a year. It could last longer. But the more to, most important about the vaccine is it, it, um, we still don't know if, you, if this vaccine does not make you catch the COVID. And we still don't know if this, if taking the vaccine can prevent you from passing the COVID from one person to another. This is still under under trial and under studying studying the moment, but it can last up to a year longer. Still, we'll get more update on it as the time goes on. Right. Okay. Um... So you mentioned of, um, the vaccines and the different types of vaccines, and it might be new for people to know this, but the question that was posed is, do we need more vaccine because of the new types of COVID or are the vaccines that we've got now sufficient? At the moment, there's different type of variant of COVID in the world. We've got the Brazilian one, we've got the UK one, which is the most popular. And um, I think, I'm not sure there's a new variant from India. We're still um, uh, lo looking into, and the South African variant, but the, 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 the scientists think, I don't think this should affect the, the vaccine we, we, we're giving and we should continue giving the vaccine. I don't think that's gonna affect this for the time being, they're still looking into it and then they don't think it can affect what we're doing at the moment. It's just like the flu vaccine, you take it every year. Viruses are very clever, they change every year, but rarely it affects the flu vaccine and affects from people having like not being controlled. So, so at the moment, go ahead, do it. We still think it's effective. Okay, thank you. And time will tell, is, this is a new thing. We're studying it every day. In terms of the vaccine itself, um, why do we have to have two vaccinations? Um, um, why is that space? Why is there a space between the two vaccinations? They found that as you, first of all, when you get the vaccine, that's important for everybody, to, people to know that if you get the vaccine, don't be so reassured that, okay, I've got the vaccine, I'm safe. No, your body needs few weeks for to develop the antibodies and immunity. Okay, and they found that they, if you leave 10 to 12 weeks, your body is good enough to develop a good immunity toward against the, the, the COVID and the second jab will even promote more immunity toward it. So it's important you take two, two it's like when you give, as simple as that, children, we give them immunization at eight weeks. Um, uh, um, uh, I think after 12 weeks and uh, 16 weeks. And it is the same. some of these um, jabs are the same. This is to boost your immunity. So it does give you immunity. It starts at least two to three weeks after that, after you take the jab. So you need to keep wearing the mask. You need to do social distancing, distancing and gov uh, follow the government guideline. And the 12 weeks, it's a booster to your immunity. So it's important. Okay. If I could just, just add to that, if, if people watching have um, <clears throat> had their first jab, when they had that, they would have been given their appointment for their second jab. So you've already got that. You don't have to worry about making another appointment or finding it in your diary. You've already got that. So I just really ask people to, to do, do come back for that second jab. Um, as Ban says, it's, uh, I think about it as, yeah, when you're teaching someone something, you tell them it once and then you kind of come back to it a bit later and just remind them again. It's a bit like reminding your body of how to protect you. So it's really, really important that people do come back for their second jab. Um, and we've, we've got all the stocks of those ready for people, kind of with your name marked on it. Uh, so, um, yeah, make sure you stick to your appointments and um, come, come back for that second jab. It's really, really important. Thank you, Alex. Just a reminder, if anyone wants to ask, ask any questions, you can do so in the Q&A um, section at the bottom of the screen. Um, so on our next um, question, because the vaccination already has coronavirus in it, and we know coronavirus is more likely to take the lives of Black Asian people, is there not a bigger chance of dying from the vaccine? That's a good question. The vaccine does not got coronavirus in it. The vaccine got 
just the spike protein of the COVID. So the COVID is a circle and you've got that spike protein. It just got the spike protein and is not a live virus. So it does not give you COVID. Okay. Right to and the point. Yeah. yeah okay. Does yeah, not give really you helpful. COVID. However, sometimes people develop COVID after the vaccine, possibly because they had COVID without knowing they're having it or carrying it before the vaccine, and they develop the symptoms after that. That doesn't mean the, co the vaccine has given them COVID. COVID, it's a non-live vaccine. So it does not give you the disease and will not give you the disease. It's possibly you might be a carrier of COVID before you had the vaccine and symptoms appeared after three days. And that's why we advise Asian African people to take it because they are at high risk. We still don't know why they are at high risk of developing severe COVID disease. And we still, the scientists are still looking to it. And that's why, please take it. Get the immunity better than get the disease. Okay, so in terms of um, a lot of cohort of uh, the cohort of the groups that we represent at Self Help UK do come from an Asian and Black background. So essentially, where can we um, find up to date information about research that's been do been done around that and the effectiveness? Um, well, the, the the symptoms and the effects of coronavirus on the communities. Um, is there somewhere that these communities can go to find out updates about, like you said, you mentioned? I'm going to give this, I know gov.uk is the best website, but also I'll leave that to Alex is better than me in, in, in giving you this. Yeah, no, thanks, Ban. So um, absolutely, as you've said there, uh, all the official government websites are a really good starting point. If people are on social media, then I'd really encourage you, please look for the blue tick next to the accounts that really indicates that's a, um, a trusted and verified source. Um, you can also go uh, to the um, Clinical Commissioning Group's website. Um, after this call, we'll, we'll send around the direct link to the place where we've gathered all the information together. Um, and also the, the City Council and the County Council have gathered quite a lot of information onto their websites um, as well. So, um, yeah, I guess I'd say kind of go to the, the places that you would expect to get trusted information. It's really important that you have a conversation with your family and with your communities as well, of course. But if you hear something from someone that isn't a doctor or isn't an expert in this space, just, just, just ask twice, just double check. Um, and then maybe go go back to the NHS websites or the local council websites um, just to see if um, you can kind of verify that information. A lot of this is really new. I've learned things over the last year and certainly over the last three or four months during this vaccination programme that I never thought I'd learn about um, all sorts of things. Um, but, uh, and so it's OK to be confused or unsure or surprised. I've been all those things at various times when I've learned lots of new things. Um, but yeah, go back to those trusted sources um, rather than taking at face value what you might see on social media or on your WhatsApp. You know, I've, I've had to have that conversation with my parents and my friends and family where they've sent me stuff on WhatsApp and I've said, well, that's just, it's just not true. Um, and it's quite difficult, isn't it? It feels a bit weird. You know, I had to tell my sister the other day that the virus doesn't change your DNA. Um, and she's, a, she's really smart. She's a scientist. But she'd heard that and was saying to me, well, what do you think? Are you going to have it? Because it changes your DNA. And I had to say, no, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Um, but it's, it's surprising sometimes what people who you think are um, sensible people have heard and pass along without, um, without checking it. So I guess I, yeah, I'd encourage you not to not sort of be that person and definitely go back to the um, really trusted sources um, to check things. OK, that's great. Thank you, Alex. Um, so the next question is, I suffer from diabetes and sickle cell. Would the vaccine make this worse? No, the vaccine will not make you worse, but you need to have protection. You are the more people you are at risk and we encourage them to take it. So no, it does not affect it. Okay. Are the ingredients in the actual vaccines derived from animals? The ingredients has no animal product, no egg product. Doesn't carry any animal or egg product. 
So the next question is the Sorry. vaccine. Sorry, if I could just add on that one as well, just to just to tag on, if that's okay, on these sort yeah. of ingredients uh, there. Um, it's been um, sort of checked and validated by um, Islamic scholars as well that having the vaccination doesn't invalidate your fast. Yes, absolutely. So there'll be potentially some people now desperately checking to see when the sun's going to set and when they can break their fast. <laughs> today. Um, but yeah, the vaccination absolutely doesn't invalidate your fast and um, so if you are fasting for ramadan then please and um, that shouldn't stop you from having your vaccination as well excellent that's really helpful information um so this question is about the duration and how long the vaccine's been out for uh, the question is the vaccine hasn't been out for long enough how do we know it's safe i think we're um as i said before any medicine, um, I think now people are more concentrating because it, on the vaccine because it's all over the place, but people don't know on there's medicine hap or, or introduced every day. And um, um, as we said, there's the M MHRA, which is a, a UK regularity body. It looks at this vaccine. It looks at the experiment went through. It looks at, at this, all the scientific evidence that it's safe before making it go into the community and NHS in NHS will not give patients or people something that's not safe. Also, I, I've, I've heard this from many people um, as well, that um, vaccines takes years to, to happen and so many experiments. I agree with you, vaccines takes years, it goes through so many stages. However, the Italian, this time is a different. The world suddenly went into a pandemic, which we were all surprised by every country was surprised every country was not prepared we lost so many people the the hospitals or nhs they were overwhelmed with the amount of admissions and and the scientists had kind of honest as i say they worked so hard and they kind of did not go or leave stages but every stage of the experiment they did they looked in into it they analyzed the, the the results and and went to the second stage so it has been looked at by in in a more concentrated in a more short time because they wanted to provide a safe vaccine that prevent further death and further spreading of this virus imagine without this this vaccine uk would not be going out of lockdown at the moment it would yes, have been yeah and, 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 and naturally it. yeah and naturally understanding where these questions come from because they come from yeah. a space where you're not privy to that information that you're privy to and that's yeah. why we're having this so these questions are really trying to be um put people's i wouldn't say in mind that it is but having some sort of reality check and understanding what is going on because we're not being told it and that that's where this question comes from the next question um is the truth is i feel like we are a part of a social experiment and i don't trust the government and the vaccine um black people have always been targeted is this another way of getting rid of us now this sentiment that has come from one person but i think it is representative in different cohorts as well um i don't know um who would like to answer that alex would you want to add us and then i'll yeah. add as well yeah i'm really happy to answer that and i think it's um it's a really it's quite a, it kind of really gets me when i hear things like that i think that's really, it's really it makes me really sad that um the I have to choose my words really carefully because I'm a civil servant effectively, but you know, the events that we've all seen over the last few years, um, the impact of political austerity choices, the tragedy that we saw at Grenfell, you know, those things affect me as a, as a white man, uh, but I know they will affect friends, family, uh, members of the wider community that I'm part of that are from different backgrounds as well and affect them much harder. So it's really hard for me to kind of imagine how, to truly imagine how that makes people feel, but I can I can have a go, it's, I can try. And, and I am in a position of privilege, as I say, as a white man to, to kind of try and help and persuade and encourage people to take what is a bit of a leap of faith and I think the only way we can do that is through ongoing conversations. So my little contribution to that has been trying to support 
leaders in the um, black and minority ethnic communities and other communities to to help have that conversation. So we've been working really closely with the with pastors and imams and other leaders who aren't from a religious background to to kind of broker those conversations and try and help people work through those challenges. So I haven't got a, an answer, but I can I can empathise and I really encourage you to to have those conversations with with trusted leaders in your community. And if I can help in any way with that, I, I will. The the only bit I'd add of of kind of some some sort of hard facts uh, coming back to sort of the vaccine. We do know it has been tested widely, not only on um, white um, patients, but also those from a non-white background. So I mean, I've got the numbers here in front of me, you know, 10% of participants in both the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca trials were, were black, um, three and a half percent were Asian, 26% from a kind of Hispanic background from the Pfizer one, um, just because of where they drew from different countries so this isn't something that's been developed by white people only for use on white people it is a vaccine which is safe and appropriate for everyone no matter what their background is um but yeah it's it's really it's really hard and and i kind of um i worry a bit about our sort of society and and what the changes are that we need to make it better I guess what I'm saying today is you might have concerns and I understand where those concerns come from. Lots and lots of scientists, lots of experts have validated that this vaccine is safe and appropriate. And it's been administered to what, 35 million people, I think in the UK and hundreds of millions of people across the world. Um, so we know it is safe uh, on quite a wide scale. Um, but everyone's got to make their own decision and kind of work through their own sort of choices. But I'd encourage you to do that through really good conversations with trusted members of your community and your family as a starting point. I hope that goes some way to answering the question. It's a really difficult one, but I'm-, I'm Yeah, can I, can I add to that? And I think it is a, such, a, such a difficult question and it's, you can understand totally, sorry, children are having a bath in the background, but um, you, can, you can understand totally in the trust of the government, especially from the BME communities. I, I totally get that. But I think what we've got to remember is this is not from our government. This is not from the political system as such. It's from the health. You know, it's from scientists across the world, from all cultures and backgrounds that have but it been a part of developing this. Um, it's not just British or, or white white scientists that have done this. It's people from all different cultures, and I think that's what I'm sort of remembering in terms of trusting the political system. That's different from maybe trusting the health system and the health services. And I hope you know most people do trust the NHS and and trust the the background around that, which is the way that I would sort of put it. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Martha, um, because th these these concerns are real, they're live, and as an organisation, we'll never, ever um, sideline them, they need to be talked about, but there is something key to differentiate, potentially we can have conversations about what, what it means politically, and how people feel politically, and what the health um, side of it, that, that does pay, um, it pay, yeah, it gives the credit where the credit's due, I guess, in that area. But these are these are areas that are maybe contentious here, but are widely spoken about in different communities. Mm -hmm. And we've got to respect them for existing and respect them for being there. And I and I know all of us here do that. And I'm I'm really happy that I'm able to put that across that question across to everyone as well because we could have easily said, oh well, no, we're not going to ask that. But this is. These are from people from the community and it's important to highlight that. Well, like, well um, COVID has shown that the health inequalities for what they are. You know, COVID has, has put shone a light on, you know, people from BAMA backgrounds, people from poorer backgrounds are more likely to die from COVID because they are more likely to be unwell. They are more likely to have other illnesses. They are more likely to be in poorer professions where they have to work anyway. They haven't been able to shield away. It's really shone a light on the inequalities that we live with and that exist within our communities. And I think it's always really important. It, it, nothing ever happens in isolation and COVID has really shown that. And I think that's why it's always a good opportunity to bring up these sort of issues when we're discussing any anything really because yes. it, it, you know it, it's not fair it's not equal and like they say you know we've we've all been hitting the same storm but we're not in the True. same boats and that's that's 
a very important statement, I think, for COVID as a whole. Yeah, sure. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. We've got 10 minutes left of this session and um, I think we're halfway through the questions. So what I don't want uh, to go to waste is number one, don't worry if the questions aren't answered in this one hour session. What we will do is um, get those answered questions and we'll be sending them out by way of email, but also we'll be printing hard copies for members, um, lead group leaders and their members as well. But I have spotted that we've got three questions that have been posed. So if I may um, go ahead and ask these questions that have been posed in our Q&A. Um, how does this vaccine interact with um, psychotic meds? Um, and, and it follows on what effect does it have and does a person with mental health who does not have capacity um, of choice or have the capacity and have choice to decide when they become well. So I guess um, the first question would be um, how does this vaccine interact with psychotic meds? We have not been updated by any any by by the uh, mental health teams or psychiatrists about interaction between the COVID vaccine and their antipsychotic or medication. As a GP, I've not been updated, and the CCG has not updated us that there is any contraindication on that. I'm um, um, Alex. Do you want to do do you confirm that with me? Yeah, I, I think that's right, um, but we can probably double check that one because that's really important. And, and I think if I just kind of play back what you said, Baron, because you did that. You did that doctor thing where you use you use big long words. So I think oh, um, uh, when we did when we did the course um, about the Astra, all the vaccine, it wasn't mentioned about the yeah. um, any any effect or from or it has been updated from the mental health team or any yeah. any newsletter to us to say you should be cautious with people taking antipsychotic. But yeah. we can check that as well. Yeah, I th I th I, that's what I think I heard. So I think that's right. Um, and it's not that we've there's no evidence either way but it's probably quite likely if there'd been problems we'd know by now um uh so it's not just that we haven't looked at it or checked it out it's just it's there there doesn't appear to be any issues but i think it's a really good question for us to double check uh and we can um we can share that one back yeah. okay yeah that's quite an important area um I guess the question also leads into does the person with mental health who does not have the capacity have a choice to decide whether if they think, should take that? I think the Mental Capacity Act is clear, is if the patient has no capacity, then you act on the best interest of that patient. And is, is that right, Alex? Would you support me with that? That's right. There is a process that we've um, used in some scenarios with people with residents who have severe learning disabilities where we're able to make a we the courts are able to make a decision on their behalf that gets used for a number of medical and operations and medicines and things like that um, uh, so there is a process but that's quite rarely used no one is compelled to have this vaccine and if you are able to make your own decisions then you can decide yes or no yourself if you need support to make that decision and an advocate and, and so on, then that can be provided as well. And um, again, that's quite a detailed question. So that might be one that we'd want to, um, again, maybe kind of get a little bit more detail on and, and set out the scenarios really clearly. Yeah, that'd be really helpful. I know that Sasha's kindly put down in the chat. Um, if we've got any questions that have not been answered, then to visit this website and it's in the chat section. And there's also inquiries um, line phone number two that you can access in the room. Okay. Um, so the next um, question is, we briefly spoke about it, so it might just need a brief answer. What happens if a person has coronavirus and recovered? Do they still need a vaccine? Yes, if you still had the COVID, you can, you, and, and if it is your, if you're at risk, patient or it's your time to take your COVID according to the government with age because I know the age is now from 42 and above then you're eligible and it, it you should be within after four weeks after you have COVID you have to leave four to yeah four to five weeks after you have the COVID tested positive to to take the jab. You have had to test positive four to five weeks after having COVID. Yeah you can begin right okay. 
Is the vaccine compatible with those undergoing cancer treatment? Yes, it's, it's very important that you take the vaccine, even if you're taking chemotherapy or cancer treatment. Um, we know that um, the, the people who are taking cancer treatment or chemotherapy reduces their immunity, make them more risk of developing infection. However, a certain time during the chemotherapy, their bloods um, become slightly better. So it's for the oncology team or the team who are treating them is to choose the, perfect, the, the, the good time when they could have the vaccine um, so it's decided. I had a patient who was decided by the oncology team when to get the jab according to the blood result he had. It has been said that the people with less immunity might um, develop less antibodies and resistance of, uh, th than a normal people with good immunity. That is true. That is a possibility. But the human body is very clever. There's so many ways to develop immunity and it's advisable to take it even if so. And this is liaised by the oncology team with the, I think, the, uh, the local um, jab um, line, um, um, vaccine helpline, and they can plan when they can take it. That's very kindly um, um, done by the oncology and, and the patient and the local uh, helpline for to book for vaccine. Isn't, am I right, Alex? Yeah, that's spot on. And um, uh, it's actually, yeah, I think you said it, but I'll just uh, say again, um, it's one of the few scenarios where you could maybe have your jab a little bit earlier than you'd otherwise be entitled to, and also can have your second jab, maybe not quite at that 12 week period, you could have it a bit earlier, because it's so important to get the timings right if you're having chemo or radiotherapy or whatever. So it's really important that people have that conversation with their consultant or whoever's looking after their care so that that can be really carefully planned out. That's helpful. Thank you so much, Alex. I think what we're going to do is um, just take this last question and then we will wrap up this session. It's gone really quick, hasn't it? Um, so some of my group members, this is a question from somebody, weren't told about the vaccine side effects when they actually had the vaccine and now they are scared to have the second vaccination. Um, is there, does there need to be more work done around informing people of the side effects? Is there a loophole there? Um, and what, what, how could we respond to this particular concern? I'll leave that to you, Alex. Yeah, no, that's a really, it's a really good um, question. So the list of, um, there is a bit of a list of um, the side effects and they are quite mild. Um, so, um, you know, it's a sore arm, you feel a bit tired, you feel a bit heavy, a bit achy, you might feel a bit sick. It's, it's like you've got a bit of a bad cold really, or, or yeah, you've got that pain in your arm. My friend who had it the other month, he said his arm just went a bit dead for 24 hours or so. So they are, they're not, terrible side effects but they're 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 pretty annoying i think is probably how i'd summarize it you do feel pretty rough for a day or so um or some people have no side effects at all um there's definitely a distinction i'll just emphasize it again because it is really important there's a distinction between those normal side effects and then what ban described a bit earlier of the blood clotting symptoms the very very rare blood clotting symptoms from the um that might occur with the astrazeneca vaccine they are very different um, so so that's quite that's quite important um, can we do more to help people understand the side effects yes i'm sure we can um, and it's a helpful reminder um, everyone who gets their jab gets a leaflet um, that explains all that um, if you um, struggle with um, uh, if you're blind there's a braille version of that leaflet that leaflet exists in pretty much every language well the top 20 or 30 or so languages um, that are spoken in the uk it's also available in British Sign Language as well. Again, all those um, links are on our website and the Braille and Easy Read versions of those leaflets are also at all the vaccination sites. So um, uh, happy to do more. I guess there's also a bit of an ask of if people, um, if, the, if the kind of regular leaflet isn't right for you, then do say and ask. There are the materials there, as I say, in lots of different languages and lots of different um, formats. So do ask for those when you've had your jab and we'll look to publicize the availability of those a bit better as well. Is it a common um, thing for whoever is um, 
actually giving the vaccination for them to inform the patient that they what the side effects could potentially be because I know that there are group members that find it difficult hard of hearing um, and also just the idea around reading as well and also memory um, especially if individuals are going in individually um, without anybody they've been told information and coming away with it I guess I guess it's um, is there is there that scope to be hang on 100% because it is creating confusion and concern for people when they're going home and they they weren't expecting you know a dead arm for a lot of people they wouldn't wouldn't associate that with a vaccination yeah so the um Bam might know a bit more certainly when i've been in the vaccination centers it's um <clears throat> it's quite uh um they're busy they're really busy and i kind of emphasize that a because sometimes i struggle to take in all the information if you're in a busy and a new environment so i really understand that but also we have got to kind of get through people so whilst we try and spend as much time as possible kind of helping people understand what's going on and, and giving information there's a there's a bit of we've got to kind of move on to the next patient as well so it's entirely possible that at times not all the questions have been answered or people haven't maybe had quite all the time they'd want to have the conversation about what might happen afterwards so um, that's why we do rely on that leaflet if it's not in the right format or if it's not quite being given out all the time or people are losing it then I'd be keen to kind of understand a bit more about that. And as I say, all the you can look it all up and they're all linked from our website in every language, mm -hmm. format and style. So um, hopefully that'll be a helpful place if you aren't thank sure. You. Kind and of goes back also, to what I was saying earlier around trusted sources. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's um, so then that just links into what um, Sasha's popped in. There is a, a query line as well, a number for people who don't have that access um online either plus if they're worried they can call their gp and ask for advice oh perfect yeah that's really good that's they can call good, yeah. 111 as well and they 111 are, are very helpful on this as well so 111 and the g we'll call the gp yeah. yeah yeah um i'm going to have to leave the questions there because we've we've managed to get ourselves to 7 p.m um i want to firstly say a big thank you to you ban and to you for coming i'm aware that there's people here listening and people that will be actually watching too um, um later that um all the questions haven't been answered but what we're going to do is get the answers to you um for sure um that won't go amiss um and also this will be recorded for people to watch and share um too um before i say a proper goodbye and uh, just a quick thanks to sasha for organizing this and pulling it together as well um, and for martha for supporting and before we go just martha a few words before we end this session yeah i just wanted to say thank well thank you very much for coming and um, i also wanted to say a couple of other events that we've got coming up um for anybody listening so we've got a funding for small groups webinar tomorrow from two till three so that will give top tips on how to get funding for your group um and we've got a mental health network meeting on the 11th of may for mental health awareness meet uh, week so that will be for all groups that deal with people with mental um health problems which is probably every group because everybody has got you know certain issues um, and that will be um, a good session so if anybody listening is interested in that please email outreach at selfhelp.org.uk and I will send you all the details I'll pop that in the chat as well and thank you that's great well thank you so thank much you. um really appreciate you all being here if there was anything else that alex and ban you wanted to mention before we go um if not we can end it here uh please just reassure patients if they're concerned call us i've as a GP, I've had so many people calling me worried about this, and I've discussed and explained to many people. So if if just call your GP if you're concerned, just ask, um, just go and get the vaccine. Please get protected. It's a serious disease. You can see what's happening in, in India. It's really worrying. Uh, so good luck for everybody. And I hope this, this talk has helped. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye, Bye Alex. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye.